Hi, this is the first lecture for American Popular Culture. This is your introduction to popular culture. Again, my name is Stacy Takis. Um, if you need to contact me for any reason, you can email me or you can send a message to the Selly for this class. Um, that's like our Twitter feed. Uh, messages will go to me, not to the whole cell. And if it's something that I think is relevant to everyone, I will pass it on. But um, you can also use Sally just to communicate with me. Okay. A word really quickly about discussion and group projects. Um, for the discussion, you need to earn 100 points over the course of the semester. You can earn up to 120 if you have uh, good participation throughout the semester. Uh, to do this, there are a couple of components. Um, it's, I'm kind of gamifying the discussion points, so you can earn them incrementally. You can earn up to four points a week for reading your peers' posts. That means you have to read a substantial number of them. It doesn't mean you have to read one or two and you get four points. Um, you have to read many more. Um, in addition to reading, you can earn points for posting, and you can earn up to two points per post uh, each unique day. Right? So if you post on three different days throughout the week, you're going to earn, you can earn up to six points. Combine that with reading your peers' posts, and there's your ten points. Um, there are other ways to earn those ten points as well. Uh, but, you know, if you do that every week, uh, you should be good. The group projects are not projects per se, really, but it's a way of getting you to participate in shaping the materials that we're using in the course, because, of course, Popular culture is a broad field. I know a little corner of it, and I'm sure that you guys have your own interests and uh, desires, things you want to talk about. So this is your chance to bring those things in. So you shouldn't think about this as a, a really formal project, but rather just a way of interjecting a little bit of yourself into the course. Right? Um, the group projects will consist of you working with three or four of your peers to define a set of reference materials related to that week's readings, so if you're assigned, for example, to do the assignment in week three, I believe we'll be on chapter three of the textbook. So that will be the reading that you're asked to um, illustrate. So that reading is about the functions of popular culture. You might go out on the internet and find various links uh, related to some of the materials covered in that chapter. You might find images that you want to use to illustrate course concepts. And you collect all of those and you put them on our Blend Space page. And I'll put up a video later about how to use that page. Um, note that if you want to get this project done early, there are two opportunities, one in week three and one in week four. The due date for week three would be 125, and the due date for week four would be 2-1. If you do have uh, conflicts or a particular interest in one of the units from later in the semester, you can let me know by 118, and I will try to accommodate your wishes. Right, but otherwise, I will just randomly assign you to a group. So our topic for today is what is popular culture? And as this graphic illustrates, popular culture uh, is a really broad field. Um, there's no one specific way to define the term. It's really more of a conceptual category. Uh, and it's often f defined in contrast to other such categories. Such, for example, elite culture, folk culture, mass culture, dominant culture. We'll talk about all of these things at some point in the semester, and a couple of them today. But, you know, what is popular culture is often defined by what it is not. To understand popular culture, we need to know uh, several other key terms, and so the chapter starts by defining some of these terms, the first term being culture. What do we mean by culture? And there are various ways to understand this term as well. In the old days, as in before the 19th century, Culture referred usually to elite art objects, or what we might think of as high culture, so things like opera and literature, painting, and those uh, exclusive arts that were hard to access for the ma vast majority of people. These art objects were presumed to have aesthetic qualities, which um, could help enlighten or civilize people. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that, that the word culture shares with the word cultivate a root. Right? The idea is that you can use cultural objects to cultivate refined sensibilities in people. Okay? So in, you know, it, before the 19th century, this was really the definition of culture. It was a synonym for high culture. Right? Um, so this is a, a graphic novel or a 
compendium of graphic novels. And it's sort of making fun of this concept. Um, this is an image of a, what we call a Brahmin, okay, which is you know, a very snobby, well-educated person. Um, and you can see that under this model of culture, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about the masses and what they might uh, bring to the table as far as culture is concerned, right? So, you know, please put an end to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's dragging us all down. Right? This was uh, this kind of judgmentalism was a prominent feature of early definitions of culture. By the 19th century, though, um, anthropology as a discipline had emerged, and anthropologists were being exposed to many other cultures and, um, you know, started to question whether we should be defining one culture's ways of acting as superior to another culture's. Um, so they adopted a more general definition of culture, which is simply the values, symbols, beliefs, and rituals used by social groups to organize themselves and explain the world. Uh, so this is the idea of culture as a whole way of life, right, including what we eat, how we dress, what languages we speak. These are all elements of culture. Um, and there's much less judgmentalism entailed in this definition of culture um, because for anthropologists, no one culture is better than another. They're all just different and, in their difference, interesting. Cultural studies practitioners, people who study popular culture, uh, largely agree with these anthropological definitions. Um, and the goal of cultural studies is to uh, study the shared text, rituals, symbols, and practices that bind groups together. Um, so metalheads, for example, metal music fans, right? And this is a, somebody's meme that I got off the internet. Right? Metal's not just music, it's a way of life, right? This captures that sense of culture as, as a social binding agent, if you will. It's those symbols and rituals and practices, in this case, music, a way of dressing, a kind of language, gestural language in particular, that all fans of metal will recognize, um, and it's sort of, the clothing, for example, is a badge by which different fans recognize each other as a shared a cohort. In our approach to culture, we're going to adopt more of this anthropological definition, and we're going to think about culture more as a process one engages in, rather than a set of objects or references one possesses. So it's not about knowing a particular type of literature or a particular kind of art. Right? That's not what makes you cultured. What makes you cultured is using signs to communicate with others and to forge bonds with others. So we're interested in this, um, these processes. And the definition that I give in chapter one is culture is the active process of generating, circulating meanings and pleasures within a social system. And that's what we're going to study in this course. Okay? So culture is the first key term we need to know. The second key term is mass culture. And mass culture is a phrase that's often used by people who practice what we call critical theory. And you'll learn about that term more later in the semester. Uh, but mass culture tends to refer to the fact that much of our culture is industrially produced for commercial profit. And so it's designed largely in a standardized way to appeal to the masses using often the lowest common denominator of uh, what we have in common. Right? So these texts are standardized. They're, uh, in some ways, derivative. They're often of poor quality, uh, but they're easily easy, easily accessed, right? They're easy to understand. Now, for critical theorists, um, this term, mass culture, is actually a little derogatory. Um, from their perspective, what commercialized, industrially produced culture does is uh, produce political cuisance. That is, it teaches us what the social norms are, and it enforces them. Right? So this is from the film They Live by John Carpenter. And in that film, uh, the aliens have taken over American society, and they use the media to pacify the rest of the population. And so we can see they use television and the message that's being projected subliminally to people when they look at this image is obey, right? follow order, obey, conform, no thought, sleep, right? submit. Right? Newspapers are spreading this. Films are spreading this. TV is spreading this. These are the messages. And this is very much a kind of critical theorist's approach to popular culture. They see all of these mass-produced, industrially created forms of culture as, um, as ways of controlling people. 
Um, and that's certainly one way we can approach popular culture. We will talk about it a little bit. It's not the predominant way that we're going to approach it, however, because um, this way of looking at culture as mass culture uh, focuses only on production and distribution. It doesn't focus on consumption. It doesn't focus on the ways that we use these products. And that's really what we're going to be interested in.